We didn't get permits for anything. We didn't <laughs> we didn't ask to do anything. We just asked for forgiveness right. with any of the stuff that we did. Right. So you didn't you just showed up with a helicopter. Right. Yeah. They didn't know it was coming. <laughs> right. You know, we would just <laughs> land where the ambulance heli lands. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, the last episode was season two when you guys did DEI mm -hmm. and you spread that across the whole season. And we had like 20 comments. Please go through all of Dream Car Garage with your dad. We want to see more. So I fired up the first episode of season three in 2002. I thought it was a great episode. So I just wanted to go through sure. just that episode. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like, I think you guys kind of pulled out all the stops for episode one. <laughs> We never knew if we were going to have another season. <laughs> right, right. Was it, like, I guess the first season, but, you know, you got the hang of it in season two. Was it nerve-wracking at all, kind of going into TV, having no idea? Uh, sure. Like, yeah, you felt I mean, the pressure? Well, we just didn't know if we, every every year, the longest contract we ever had was a two-year contract. Okay. So, we did almost 20 years total. right. So it was every two years, ah, are we going to do this next year? And we would go, okay, this is the last season of this contract. We better make it a good one if we want to renew. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, hi there. I'm Tom Matthew. Welcome to a brand new season of Dream Car Garage, the show that's all about dream cars and having fun driving them. I'm Peter Clute. It doesn't matter if you own a car from the 20s or from the 60s, we've got something for you this year. We've got a maintenance tip, we've got a pro buying tip, we've got a really neat new segment on a dream garage. We're going to take that from start to finish. And of course, we've got the restoration on a 65 Shelby. We're going to take that from teardown to complete concourse ready with a few modifications. So you guys lined up a big shoot day at Watkins Glen. Well, this wasn't at the Glen. Oh, this was at Phoenix. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you line up <clears throat> that? Who do, Whose cars did you use? Um, I think, uh, well, for Watkins Glen, uh, it was, a, it was a, I think, a race weekend or a Shelby weekend or something there. Yeah. So, and I had raced with a guy, Bill Murray, who right. looked after Miller's cars, Larry Miller. Great guy. Fabulous collection of cars. And, uh, and we said, hey, you know, can we shoot some of the race cars? Right. And they were fabulous. Like, literally, here's the keys to Ken Miles' GT40. Yeah. Here's the keys to the Daytona Coupe that won Le Mans. Right. They're just killer stuff. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you guys shot Phoenix, the Glen, and Mostport in this episode. Yes. <laughs> Car. In fact, we've got a brand new segment on Dream Car Garage this year called the Modern Dream Car. All that and a whole lot more right here on Dream Car Garage. Last year we did the Hemi Challenger, the year before that the Motion Camaro. For two years you Ford fans have been pleading with us to please do a Ford. Well we hear you guys, this year we're going to do the ultimate Mustang, a 1965 Shelby GT350, a complete ground up restoration. Well, a couple of months ago, Bill Ockerland out of Michigan gave us a call. He was thinking of buying 525. That's the number of this Shelby. He said it's a really nice, clean driver. So you guys did the full restoration on this GT350? Yeah, over the course of the season. And that's what we used to do. It wasn't, wasn't like car TV today where, you know, they do it in a week. They do it in 24 hours. And they certainly do it from beginning to end in the same episode. Right. You know, and... We were pretty realistic. It took a year to do a car. Right. You know, eight months if you were just humping on the car. And so we just said, hey, we'll do a little bit every episode. Right. Was this a, did you pick this car for the season? You thought, hey, this is going to be a good one. We want to do, well, I mean, you, you did the Baldwin motion car and mm -hmm. you needed to do something pretty significant going forward. Right. We always wanted to do, we did the Baldwin motion car and kind of the ultimate Camaro, and then we did uh, a Hemi Cuda, sort of the ultimate Mopar, and then doing a 65 Shelby is kind of the ultimate Ford from that that era. So we always wanted to do the top, right? you know, the, the creme de la creme of that maker or yeah. brand. Did you 
feel the pressure for timeline for filming, like to do a, a, a full season restoration and like we have to get this done? Uh, a little bit. And the irony is, is that's how we ended up kind of getting the show is the first season when we didn't own the show and it was called i forget what it was called now they didn't get the restoration done and oh. that's how i even that's how i convinced the guy to say listen let us do the restoration we'll get it done right okay right. so you just kept that as a segment people like that yeah yeah okay yeah first thing we're going to do is test lateral continuous this was Driving in a circle. <laughs> Come on, Twenty years. Why were you testing lateral continuous <laughs> cheese? <laughs> the, the reason was is because he wanted the suspension lowered. He wanted four wheel disc brakes. He wanted it to handle better. Okay. So we were saying, okay, can we get it to actually handle better? You know, a lot of guys do mods and never test if it works. Right. So we thought, you know, we'll do it. And I forget who it was. Uh, that gave us all this stuff. It was, uh, uh, you know, the trick set up at the time. You would put this in your car. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't like today, you know, you know, you buy a Corvette. It's got all the stuff on it, all the data and telemetry and all that stuff. You can just download it from the car. Right. Back then you put this box in and it was kind of, you know, a very primitive sort of form of telemetry. Right. So, yeah. you, so you drive in a circle, get your lateral continuous sure. cheese. Yeah. Okay, we got for a zero to 60 time, we did that in uh, 8.1. And, and this is all on the street. Oh, zero, yeah. Full <laughs> test. Oh, yeah. On the street. Full test. Three different racetracks in the episode, but you had to do the test on the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And our quarter mile was a 1537. Quarter mile on the street. We did that in 93 miles an hour. Now, the roads here, they're, um, they're not exactly great roads here. <laughs> so considering stock tires and uh, um, stock suspension and a really stock motor, that's kind of what we're expecting. Very scientific test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, made for good TV. 196 feet in 10.62 seconds. That's great. We won't see the after in this episode. Was it? Did you get it to handle better? Uh, I can't remember. I think so. I yeah. think we did. And I remember. I I can't remember what track it was at, but it was a track that was really an eighth of a mile drag strip. We did that at a little drag strip somewhere. Yeah. And it was an eighth of a mile. And the the weather something happened with the weather, and we were trying to go to another place, and we said, "Oh, screw it. We're just going to do it here." And there was barely enough shutdown on the eighth of the mile to get the quarter mile in. And it was like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> almost went off the track with the car. <laughs> so this is kind of where the Shelby stuff starts. Right. Let me back that up. The last time we got a chance to spend a little time with Carroll Shelby, one of the things he talked about a lot was the Shelby Series 1. He's proud of this car. And in a segment about the modern dream car, the Series 1 is a great place to start. When Carroll Shelby set out to build this car, there were definitely issues that he didn't have to deal with back in the early 60s when he started his Cobra program. Well, from there, he went on to build a car that he wanted to be a top performer. Now, I remember when you got the Series 1 in, mm -hmm. and it was kind of, it was a decent looking car, but a little bit kind of kit car looking. Right. What... What was the reception like? Because I was only 10 at the time. What was the reception like from the car world of the Series 1? Mixed, for sure. It, it wasn't that fast. Okay. Uh, to sit in the car, especially Tom, because he was fairly tall in the torso. Yeah. His head was like right at the windshield lever. He level. He ducked to look underneath it. Mm. It wasn't a super comfortable car. Right. Um, it wasn't a real fast car. It wasn't. It was a good car. It was different. Right. You know, and it was in that sort of time period that uh, uh, Shelby was, I don't want, I don't want to say trying to make a comeback, but it was before he was really big with Ford again. Right. He'd do he his own stuff. Right. He did the Omnis, you know, with yeah, he Chrysler did stuff, yeah. and he did his own stuff. And then he hooked back up with Ford again mm. and really reintroduced that whole Shelby brand with Ford. Right. Yeah. So... I got to ask, how, how did you get Shelby on the show here? Just called him up. 
from the cease and desist letter? No, no. So that <laughs> that was kind of funny because when we started, you I don't know if you remember or not, we were the Shelby shop. Right. And then when we moved to Fourth Line, I got a letter from Shelby. And I, I thought, this is great. You know, he's going to tell me what a good job we're doing, blah, blah, blah. And it was a cease and desist or pay him 10%. <laughs> and, and what was funny is it was... It was really good. It forced us to change the name to Legendary. And then we took a generic name right. that could mean anything. Because right. it did pigeonhole us. Right. Guys weren't bringing us Ferraris when you're doing Shelby's. And uh, so then when we got him on, I remember we picked him up at the airport. Because we were kind of his guide. This was for the Toronto Auto Show. Okay. And uh, Rick Pickering was the guy that uh, brought Shelby to the auto show as well. And, and that was part of the hook on getting him on the show is, hey, Pickering was paying for him to come to Toronto anyway. Right, okay. So it okay. was very easy to get him. And uh, so what happened is we were his li- liaison. We you know, picked him up at the airport, he and Cleo, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, we had a bunch of Shelbys on display there. Mm. So Tom, first thing he says, he says, you know, Carol Shelby, do you know Peter Clue? And I didn't really met him before other than, at a convention where we sign in autographs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we say hello, and then uh, uh, Tom right away, because he would always say shit, like he did with Earnhardt. You know, you can kiss my ass. Well, he says to Shelby, yeah, I think you sued him, and he had to change the name of his company. First thing out of Tom's <laughs> mouth. And then Shelby says, oh, I've sued everybody. It doesn't matter. That's <laughs> funny. So it's not like he had any, uh, you know, bad taste in Oh, no, no, no. He, it was just, it was business. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Huh, so you guys were his liaison. Yeah. And at that time, were you guys, like, were you a little bit starstruck that you were driving Carol Shelby around? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, he, he was, you know, our hero. And like, I, we named the company just because we did a lot of Shelby's. Yeah. But we thought that he was, you know, a genius back then, what he accomplished. Mm-hmm. And until really the the movie came out, Ford versus Ferrari, a lot of people didn't understand how much he accomplished. Right. Yeah. We've got uh, several prototypes running with a supercharger, and we'll probably settle on 450 horsepower, which will give you about a 3.5, 3.6, 0 to 60, which uh, is a little better than any other production car. So, yeah. yeah. So he, he gave it, or someone gave it to you to yeah. drive. Yeah. And you had to tell Shelby... That it was an awesome car. <laughs> it, and typical Shelby, you know, zero to 60 in three-something seconds. It was not doing three-something seconds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was cool. You know, on first impression, Carol Shelby obviously wanted to build a performance car. There's lots of power here. There's a big six-speed transmission here. Shelby's original dream car was meant only to beat the Corvette. But when you're comparing yourself to modern day supercars, the competition becomes a lot more lofty. You've got a lot of real tough competition out there now. So it cuts from the series one, okay, to all these insanely dangerous shots of Tom walking around Mosport while cars are lapping to his left and his right. Who decided that he would do all these shots? One shot, he's sitting at the bottom of corner two on the track, <laughs> and someone comes down around the corner. <laughs> we did we did a bunch of stupid things, you know, back then for for interesting shots. Yeah, and we were trying to make it different. And Tom was a, a track announcer, so he had pretty much free reign at at you know at most part. Right. He had the ability to say to the guys, "Hey, you know, we just need the car or the track for a couple hours, and this is what we want to do." And he was the track announcer, so it was no problem. This is Mosport Park near Toronto, Ontario. Now, this place was built in 1961. Tom walking up the back the straight with cars. Oh, ever yeah. since then. Back in 1961, sports car racing and road racing was kind of a risky business in North America. North American car guy really didn't get a hold of it all at once. After all, 10 years ago, when these things started racing at Watkins Glen, you basically got a British production car, made a few simple modifications to it, and took it out racing. But at this time, talk about a culture clash, the V8 was just out. All kinds of horsepower was available to the North American car guy. <laughs> to be honest with you, these things really didn't do much for him. Cool car, but it ain't American. 
Now that's not all the Europeans had, especially the British. They came up with a whole lot of neat cars. In fact, 40, 50,000 people would come here to Mosport Park to see Sterling Moss win the very first Players 200 in a Lotus racing a lot of cars like these. That's a cool car. Still, not much for the North American guy to get his teeth into. Then a guy named Carroll Shelby comes along, gets the idea of a bolt in one of these V8 engines. Into a little <laughs> car. Goes a foot by him at like 100 miles an hour. Sports car racing was <laughs> just kind of fire. flinches. I spent uh, a lot of time at the Ferrari factory, the Maserati factory, Aston Martin, all of Porsche, and uh, finding out how they did it. And that was the beginning of the Cobra. I'd seen the uh, Allard that uh, Sydney did, and I drove an Allard for two or three years uh, off and on there in Texas. And you could see all of these cars coming over from Europe that uh, had a big hole up there for the engine and had a little uh, four-cylinder engine that was, uh, it was necessary to put these in them because petrol was terribly expensive as it still is in Europe. And, uh, but an American V8. So you had Carroll Shelby sitting down in the flip top Cobra. Right. Did anyone realize the significance of what he was sitting in at that time? Yes and no. We knew it was a, you know, a one off, a prototype, um, but didn't really understand how special that car was. And the irony is, you know, I looked at the car then, I looked at the car years later, and now it sits and it's, you know, probably my favorite car. Yeah, for people who don't know, it's just outside it's, the studio. Yeah, I bought it a few years ago and, and we restored it and, you know, just, it is an awesome piece of history. It's kind of where Ford versus Ferrari starts. It was the last car Miles and Remington built. Uh, it was really the last Cobra that Miles raced before he went to the GT40 program. And it was the most cheated up Cobra they ever built to beat the Grand Sports. And it was basically a Daytona Coupe chassis. That motor was out of uh, one of the Daytona coupes that went to Le Mans, the all-aluminum FE motor. It was just the trickest, fastest, lightest Cobra they ever built. And then Ford said, you're done racing Cobras. You're on the GT40 program. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the look of it, like it's longer, it's got a custom body on it, like it is... It's different than any other Cobra. There's not one part that fits from a regular Cobra onto that car. Right. And there's... Shelby just sitting in it. S sitting in it, and 20 years later, yeah. it sits in the showroom here. That's cool. Yeah. In May of 1964, Roden Track Magazine called the new Mustang Ford's four-passenger Cobra. Okay, this shot is ridiculous. <laughs> He's sitting on the exit. <laughs> now, the Mustang was an instant hit. Ford sold hundreds of thousands of them. You didn't have to take the V8, but most people wanted them that way. Carroll Shelby got a hold of one modified it for B production racing, and then about that time, he dreamed up the idea of the GT350. Now the GT350 was a high performance car with a lot of go fast parts and an homologation piece, if you will, so that the Mustang could go road racing. So you guys did a little bit of a segment just kind of on the history of Shelby, Shelby and yeah. had, cause you yeah. had him there. Yep, yeah, exactly. And we would do a lot of that if we, if we, you know, somebody interesting was around, we, and we didn't know where it would fit in. Mm -hmm. We'd build a show around that. That right. Yeah. So then you do, uh, and I don't know if we'll leave this segment in the podcast or not. But you do it. You did you do it? Just uh, you built a dream garage. Was it one little bit for each show for that season? Yeah. Same okay. thing. Same thing. And what was the deal? You just got a bunch of free stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think Snap On sponsored it at the time and. You know, they were a sponsor for the TV show and, you know, some of it would be tools and some of it would be flooring and lighting and, you know, wall art and right. all the stuff to build a cool garage at the time. Right. Yeah. So you took your buddy's garage and did it yep, there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, last year we asked you, the viewer, to help us build a dream garage and this is what you guys came up with. We're starting with a 29 by 24 garage. It's a block wall garage, painted walls. Nice double car, oversized piece. 
Over the next 13 episodes, we're going to show you the process to build a dream garage. We're going to start now with the flooring and Stonehearts expert, Steve Harold. The first thing we did when we showed up to the dream car garage. So you guys did the whole flooring and then completely outfitted it in like cool stuff and yeah. shot some of the show there? Yeah, exactly. Did Bob get to keep everything? He, well, he, he got all the stuff that was attached. Okay. But everything <laughs> else was back out again later. <laughs> Oh, Oleo Matori. We got to show this. So another sponsor-driven segment. By Crown. So Crown uh, was a sponsor of you guys. Right. And then how did Tom come up with this? He, he used to always, you know, do, um, you know, accents and stuff. And yeah. his favorite one was the Italian salesman or the Italian mechanic. And he, right. used, to, he used to just fool around with it. And then he said, you know, let's do it. And then, you know... He unbuttons his shirt. He's got the chains going. He's got the accent. And it was just hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun doing that. Hey, ciao. It's Olio Motori from Bona Fortuna Motors. Now, there's two things I always have with me when I'm going to work on your car. First thing, I have on my golden chains. It's not just an important to be good. You got to look good, too. Second thing, always on my bench, is a crown. Everybody knows it takes care of your body, moves water out of the way, so your body shouldn't want to rust. But a lot of people don't know it also, good penetrating oil. So we always make sure to put some on your locks, on the tracks, lots of crown, moves the water out of the way, also works very good like a penetrating oil. But there must be a thousand and one uses for crown underneath of the hood. Now naturally, under all of the seams, you want to put a nice bead of crown. But it also works nice as a dressing. It also <laughs> helps to condition your wires. And it conditions all of your hoses. It does a good job of keeping things looking nice and neat too. I'm Ole Amatore from Bonafortuna Motors, where we never miss an opportunity to get you to sign the work order and leave the rest up to us. <laughs> <laughs> and Crown signed off on this. <laughs> But that was the first. That was oh, I know that mild, was tame. That was the mildest one. That was his and first it, appearance. That was his first appearance. So that was pretty tame. And then uh, we did some other stuff on show openings and closes. And and uh, it was kind of funny because there was sometimes some sexual innuendo, and we got called out on it a couple of times by Speed Vision. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and and uh, uh, you know people that mm. would email us. Uh, responses not like today where they can comment on it oh they did like one time tom was being called i forget who it was like you know you're an asshole you're this you're that i can't believe you're saying all these things and and tom would answer back the email and it was hilarious that is that you <laughs> <laughs> and one, one time i forget what we did it was you know we'll have to find it but uh, we were we were kind of goofing around, and one of us was polishing a helmet. The other one was like cleaning the pipe. <laughs> yeah. The whole show closed. We did like that, and then somebody wrote in. He says, "I can't believe you guys did that." Blah blah blah. It was a lady. This is a family show, and we were just goofing off with yeah. the thing. And and uh, Tom writes back and he says, "We never even thought of that. I can't believe you think that we actually thought to put that in the show as." You know, a s sexual innuendo. By the way, send a picture of yourself. He you know? <laughs> <laughs> would do stuff. You would have blown up on social oh, media back today then. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Here's more shots of Tom walking down the middle of the racetrack. GT 350 was too. Talk about innovative. Shelby was coming up with ways to put cars on the market that nobody had even thought of yet. I had a fellow that worked for me that was really a bean counter. But we had too many bean counters, so I said, you're in charge of sales. He said, uh, okay, and he took the job on, and he put our sales organization together. He says, you know, when I was at, uh, at Ford, I, uh, I had some contacts at Hertz. He says, I'm gonna see if I can lease some, some uh, uh, sell them some of these cars. He went back and sold them. A, we, I said, go see if you can sell them 100 cars. He came back, and he says, I sold them 1,000. In the meantime, for that year, people would rent those cars, take them out to the drag strip, automatic trophy, and bring the car back. Then they started taking them 
rent them, take them home, take the engine out, put their Mustang two-barrel engine back in it and deliver it back to Hertz. And we bought those cars back and they brought a lot less than the regular GT350s and we lost some money there. Now they bring more. You think they actually bring more? Um, oh, I guess he's talking about the Hertz cars. The, yeah, the Hertz cars. So for sure, the four-speed Hertz cars right. bring more. But it was really the only, you know, less than a hundred were built right. as four speeds, and they quickly realized they were taking out clutches and trainees, and guys were beating the tar out for of rental them. cars. So yeah. all the rest were automatics. Now explain what the Hertz program was like to the guy who doesn't understand, and kind of how cool that was. Well, for twenty-nine bucks a day or whatever it was, you seventeen was it seventeen? Yeah. Okay, so you you rented the car. And, you know, guys would literally go to the drag strip, like he's saying. Guys would steal the motors because they were, you know, hypo motors in it, put a regular motor back in it. Guys would go to the racetrack, like do some road racing, car come back with, you know, remnants of a roll cage welded in. <laughs> and they were beat. I mean, they were beat up cars. Right. And then the sticks especially became really popular. And, I, you know, a, a four-speed Hertz car today brings easily 100 grand more. Right, then an automatic, well, or then a normal one. Then a regular one. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that's the king of the 66s, other than maybe a supercharged car. Right, that's the only case where rental cars bring oh. more. Yeah. Yep. Now they bring more than, than the, the, the white ones with the blue stripes, these black ones with the gold stripes, and there's about uh, another 2,000 of those things that are out there that were white with blue that they painted black and gold and try to palm them off as the Are guys actually repainting their white cars as Hertz cars, black with gold, to try and bring more? Some some guys probably. Yep. Um, and some were not all Hertz cars were black and gold, but the majority were. Right. And that but uh, what's interesting is I took a Hertz car when I started racing. Yep. So when you were a little kid, uh, I took a Hertz car original motor everything was an automatic car and turned that into the first race car that i raced and just you know welded all the seams and put a cage in it and just and what was that car worth at the time man i can't remember that would be 30 years ago um yeah 94 95 yeah 40 grand 50 grand so a decent exp Decently expensive car, car to start with right. as a race car. But what was interesting is back then you had to have a real Shelby to mm. go race. You couldn't just take a Mustang. It and had to be, it. Yeah. yeah, it had to be a real Shelby. So they ended up, for a while, they ended up bringing more as race cars mm. than they did as street cars. Because someone already did the work. Right. Ah. Yeah. Off as the Hertz cars. This is the stuff that legends are made of. There's as many stories as there are Shelbys. There might even be a few extra Shelbys around. Even the name GT350 has got its own little legend. So it came to naming the car, and uh, this is kind of cool. The guys from Ford had come out, and we had five or six meetings. So twelve of us were sitting around in a room, and they were talking about names of it, like this was a big deal. And I've always said one thing: a name doesn't make a car; a car makes a name. So I finally said to a guy that was sitting there in the meeting, one of our guys, I said, how far is that building over there? He said, what the hell are you talking about? I said, step it off, tell me how far. He says, 348 feet. I said, okay, we'll call it a GT350. You guys can get on a plane and go back to Detroit. So the GT350 <laughs> started everything off. It became a performance icon for all Mustangs. And from the GT350 came the GT500 and then the Boss 302, and then 35 years of a long line of performance cars that captured the imaginations of the American public, captured the hearts of a whole lot of car guys who still like to take them out and run them. Okay, what, how much did Hot Wheels pay? I forget <laughs> what it was. They paid a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite the shot there. Yeah. <laughs> dinky car promo. D dinky car promo is exactly that. Oh, that's good. Yeah. What was Shelby like just hanging out with him? Was he, did he, was he, I don't know, did he live up to his persona kind of thing? Yeah. Just a gruff guy. Mm -hmm. Like comes across as just a good old Texan. Mm -hmm. Sharp dude. Mm. You know, loved to have a good time and just, yeah. He was exactly that. Hmm. But I think he's one of those guys that just had bigger balls than anybody else yeah. and just sold, 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 and just tried it. Right. You know, didn't think about 
the next move really. I, sh- I shouldn't say that. He probably thought about it more than people, you know, would let on, but just not afraid to try anything. Didn't, right. Didn't care. Like when he got an order for a thousand cars, that must have been like, holy cow. Yeah. Got to build a thousand and, cars. And now. at the same time, so he, that's in, you know, 65, he's probably getting the order for the 66 models. He's building the 65 R models and won the B production championship. Yep. He's racing Cobras and winning races. And now he's involved in the GT40 program. Like he is a busy boy in the middle of all this. Like it was a very short period mm. that they went from, you know, let's call it 63 and now we're in 65 or six. And he's done a ton of stuff. I mean, he won the manu- he won Le Mans with the Daytona Coupe in 64. He won the championship with the Daytona Coupe in 65. And he's already racing the GT40s. Yeah, he's and winning everything. He's winning everything, and he's he's really doing it from scratch. Right. Nice little 288 there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can't tell it's a model, hardly. <laughs> this week's pro buying tip is on how to buy a Shelby. Doesn't matter if it's a 65 or a 70. Most important thing are the numbers. So you pick the... Most significant yeah, car there. Car. This, now, this was at Watkins Glen. This so is a Shelby convention, probably. Yeah, and this was uh, Rick Kopech's car, who was sort of the president of the SAC club for years and years and years. Right. Yeah. Most Shelbys have two sets of numbers. They have the Shelby number, in this case, SFM 5R098, which is the Essex wire car, and under this tag is a Ford number actually stamped in the body. From 1965 to 7, there are two different numbers. They actually correlate, but they're not the same number. From 68 on, it becomes the same number as the Ford number. But your best protection with buying a Shelby is either knowing the cars really well, finding somebody who does, or joining SAC, the Shelby American Club. What they have done, unlike most clubs, is they have tried to document every single car. Who, do you know who is behind that? Like, why the Shelby American Club was so kind of dialed in and did so much paperwork and tried to really authenticate everything and had shows right away? Like, it was pretty significant. It was, and it was basically Kopech, Party, Vince Liska, you know, a bunch of the early guys. Ned Scudder, yep. um, Ronnie Spain doing the GT40s, and it was just super enthusiastic guys mm. that just loved the cars, and it was kind of, you know, they they were the best at it, I think, at the time. Yeah. You know, and they always had track events, which is kind of cool where, you know, you go to an NCRS meet or, you know, other events, yeah. and there was no track events, and they always had a track event, and that's what got me into racing was one of these track events Oh, I went with uh, Mike Douglas had his race car there, and we were we were just showing cars. I'd never been on a racetrack, and he took me out for a rip, and I got hooked. Came back and bought that Hertz car and stripped it down and did it. Really? Yep. As a passenger. As a passenger. Wow, that's uh, yeah. You got hooked. So <laughs> yeah. Now I'm scared to be a passenger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So this is the vintage dream car or the ultimate dream car segment here? Yeah. In 1963, Ford did what any good company would do if they wanted to go endurance racing. They tried buying Ferrari. But as talks broke down with Ferrari, they decided to develop their own car, the GT40. The 40 standing for 40 inches from ground to roof level. Probably one of the most beautiful, sleekest endurance cars ever built. This car here, the Mark II, the 427 car, helped them win Le Mans. Not only win Le Mans one year, but four years in a row. 66, 67, 68, and 69. Part of the total performance package that Ford was developing. The ultimate in GT endurance racing cars. So how did you set this up? And did you realize, like, this is the Ken Miles GT40, like, such a significant car? Probably didn't appreciate it enough then. Mm. Um you know, getting to drive that and the Le Mans winning Daytona Coupe. Which is in another episode, yeah. Which is in another episode. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to go back and drive those cars again today, sort of 20 years later, knowing 
you know more and more about it as you know as you just do more research on it but that i mean that is a really special car whose car is that miller's right. both of those cars are miller's so big collection big collection the the best you know cobra gt40 shelby collection on the planet really and there was no one from europe or any other country here to correct you on le mans <laughs> Americans say Le Mans. Europeans <laughs> say Le Mans. We were, we were catering to the Americans. Sure, yeah. <laughs> These cars came with a monocoque chassis, 427 cubic inches, almost 500 horsepower. They had a carcraft gearbox four speed, which made them very reliable and were capable of over 200 miles an hour at Le Mans, the ultimate in the 60s endurance racer. Now, I'm lucky enough to take this for a drive around the legendary track at Watkins Glen. Nothing sounds as sweet as a 427 Ford at 7,000 RPM. Car is almost violent, pulls you forward under braking, throws you back in the seat under acceleration. Cornering, incredible. Keep in mind this car pulls well over a G on a set of bias ply tires. funny there so see this shot yeah from that's the helicopter with, that's with rudy from uh the helicopter company so uh rudy was a maniac and and we used him for helicopter shots and he was a big car guy so he would fly down we would fly down with rudy to the glen in the helicopter in the helicopter and then rudy would you know, do all this, and Dave Lestracco, the cameraman, would be hanging out of the helicopter, and Rudy was a, spe well, he is a spectacular pilot. Right. And I still remember, we were up, and uh, he's, like, skimming over the tops of the trees, and he's singing, George, George, George's Jungle, <laughs> and he would just pull up before we'd, like, whack trees. Like, he was, jeez, he was a maniac uh, helicopter pilot, but gifted. I mean, he he was a great pilot. So you guys used helicopters for the show 20 years ago because there was and no drones. Be, there was no drones. Yeah. So and Rudy loved the car, so he did it for nothing. Mm. And you know, it, like when you think about it, if we had to pay for the production of having a helicopter, renting the track, getting the cars, it was just because car guys mm. just said, "Yeah, drive my Ken Miles GT40." Yeah. You know, drive my Le Mans winning Daytona Coupe. And the track would say, yeah, go ahead. Use it. You know, y you can go out and drive it for an hour while we're on lunch. Right. And Rudy would fly down his heli. And it, it was just, it was a kind of a, a unique time that we were able to get away with a lot more mm. than you would today. Right, because TV was so much more valuable and so many less people were doing it. Right. And I think that we were so naive we didn't get permits for anything. We didn't. <laughs> we didn't ask to do anything. We just asked for forgiveness, right, with any of the stuff that we did, right. So you didn't. You just showed up with a helicopter, right? Yeah. They didn't know it was coming, <laughs> right? You know, we would just <laughs> land where the ambulance heli lands. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So what was it like driving this car? Were you nervous? Like you, it's a super expensive a car. Again, kind of too naive. Mm. You know, I'm. You know. I've, know how to drive and blah 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 it's a cool car and like not thinking it is one of the biggest pieces of history right you know, if a wheel comes off and you wad it up you're you know you're, you're in, in trouble, trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, but i'll tell you larry miller was fabulous just here you go and bill murray who looked after all the larry stuff we raced against bill with the corvette and uh, Bill was still racing a Cobra of Larry Miller's, mm -hmm. and he would beat the Snada. And these were real cars, like. Right. And, and I still remember Larry saying to Bill, um, one of the GT40s, the training was going out of it, and we were at the Glen, and uh, Larry just says to Bill, "Just drive it until she blows up." Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's a cool yeah. attitude. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Straight line what performance with top speed, unbelievable. Wow, this has got to be the ultimate ride if you want to go close to 200 miles an hour. 
the car feels unbelievable. Now the quality of this restoration is second to none. Somebody has spent a lot of time on this car. They've not only spent a lot of time, but they spent a lot of time researching what's correct. Filler caps, the right way they painted the car, the quality of the paint, exceptional. The quality of the interior, exceptional again. And the beauty of this car is the restoration is a lot, lot more than just cosmetics, it works. You feel comfortable driving this car at 160 miles an hour. I can see how the guys at Le Mans felt very comfortable at 200 miles an hour. Now, what makes this car so valuable is not the quality of the restoration, it makes it what it is in the history. The history of this car is impeccable. In February of 1966, Ken Miles and Lloyd Ruby won the 24 Hours of Daytona. Later that year, they went to Le Mans. Ken Miles and Denny Hume came in second at Le Mans, and they were kind of cheated from the win. They, had actually, they were actually leading the race, but because Ford wanted a photo finish with all three cars, McLaren actually got the win because he started further in the pits and therefore covered a greater distance. The history of this car is second to none. The quality of the restoration is impeccable. That makes this dream car worth at least $2 million, probably a little bit more. <laughs> Good investment. Great investment. <laughs> what what kind of value is that thing nowadays? Oh, a tenfold plus, plus. Yeah. You know, the, the Ken Miles thing is interesting because um, he was... He was never really given, uh, you know, credit for as much as he did. Because mm. not only was he a great driver, but he was also a really good engineer. And I think, uh, um, you know, he was able to relay what the cars needed. And Shelby, obviously, a great driver. I mean, he won Le Mans in 59 with the Aston Martin. So yep. he knew what he was doing, but he had heart problems. It wasn't like he was doing the development and the testing and that. He was a salesman. Right. And uh, Phil Remington was the other guy that was kind of the unsung sung hero that you see in Ford versus Ferrari a little bit. Yeah. But he was the genius engineer. Mm. So between Miles and Remington, it was just magic. And then on the Daytona Coupes, Pete Brock was another guy in there, you know, a young guy, designer, who, you know, sketches out this thing. I think this will be a little more aerodynamic yeah. and, you know, builds a killer car as well. So you had, you know, literally, like, you know, all the stories say, California hot rodders yeah. go and take on the world at Le Mans in Europe and win. Right. You know, it's pretty impressive. And sure, a lot of money from Ford with the GT40s, but they did it with the Daytona Coupe. Yeah. On yeah. their own. On their own. Right. Yeah, which people don't understand. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of glossed over a little bit in the movie. Yeah. Right. Huh. So do you want to uh, you want to talk about going to Le Mans this year? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what to expect. I've never been. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> historics, Le Mans historics. Yep. We're going to go run ra at race a GT40. Yeah, the prototype. Yeah. Yeah, GT105. And, uh... uh Again, I'm not sure what to expect, but the guy looking after the car for us is saying, you know, you're going to be going really fast three times a lap every lap. And it sounds like it's a, a three one-hour stints that are spread out by seven hours with the different classes. Right. And it's a so big event. It's a huge event. It's the 100th anniversary of Le Mans for the, if, and, you know, the the classic Le Mans, historic Le Mans is, is doing a special event this year to feature that. And it's also Carol Shelby's 100th birthday. Really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it's going to be... It's gonna it, be it'll neat. be a really big deal. So, yeah, I think you and Ryan will... will enjoy, I'm going to love it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a good episode. Here you guys are in the stands at Phoenix. Well, next week we're going to start disassembling the 65 Shelby. We're going to continue work on the Dream Garage. Olio, your buddy's going to be back. And we've got a <laughs> wicked you said Corvette. That there was a Winston Cup race here this weekend. There is. And I got tickets for you and all your buddies. I think they're waiting for you. Maybe check your ticket. I think it's down there. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're there. <laughs> We've got a modern dream car for you and a whole bunch more. <laughs> That's good. So what, what were you guys doing at Phoenix? You just shot some other stuff there? If we were somewhere shooting something, we would try to get as much, um, you know, to use a show opens, closes, just mm. if we were in an interesting location. 
Right. So we, we must have been there for something else. And we said, ah, let's do a show open and close here. Right. You know, there was no cup race there. No, there was no cup <laughs> race. <laughs> there. Uh, that's good. Yeah. All right. I think people will enjoy this one. I'm going to, uh, I'll watch through the rest of the season and see if there's Just any pick, more. Just pick some episodes and, and it's, it's fun to reminisce and see, you know, like I said, Rudy that flew the helicopters yeah. and you know, the guys like Miller being so generous with the cars and stuff. And, it, it was just a different time. Yeah, and hanging out with Shelby. like yeah, That's cool. Very cool. Thank you. <laughs> See you guys next week.